Hey Sun here, I'm a privacy and a security researcher and you're watching The Privacy Guides. In today's episode, I wanna tell you why I have grown completely obsessed with these little 16 gig SSDs. Um, I've been working on Super Backed OS. There's a whole bunch of Super Backed updates that I'll be sharing at the end of this episode. Uh, there's also a promo code down there if you wanna have the same price as if you were on the waiting list, but somehow you didn't grab that deal. There's a link down there, 10 first people will get $50 off. All of that said, I've been doing a lot of research on a whole bunch of things, many of which I believe will be of interest to you. Uh, and some of this involves this weird, weird little SSD from 2014. Um, when you're involved in sensitive computing, there are a whole bunch of things that you have to have right. In the context of super backed OS, uh, which I'll talk more about at the end of the episode, I wanted to make sure that data persistence was disabled and that data persistence was disabled even at the data forensics level. What does that mean? That means that when you use super backed OS and do stuff, you know, generate blocks, uh, I wanted to make sure that this data never persisted on the hard drive. What that means is if you power off the computer, the RAM, given it's volatile, will lose all of its data. And I wanna make sure that nothing was written to the USB flash drive that one uses for super backed OS. Now, how can you be absolutely sure that data is not persistent or not persisting? Well, you have to essentially, you know, take that little SSD, plug it into one of those little uh, SSD to USB 3 adapter thingies, and you want to image the drive and generate a cryptographic checksum of it and make sure that those checksums do not change between uses of super backed OS. So that's the number one reason why I am obsessed with this little SSD. When you generate a checksum, it means you have to read all of the disk, all of it, because you want to make sure that nothing has persisted anywhere on disk, not only within the partitions, you wanna make sure that from a forensic analysis standpoint, nothing has changed. So in the context of an SSD that you would buy on Amazon, that would be probably way faster than this. Um, well, you would have to read say 256 gigs or maybe 512 gigs or a terabyte. That's a lot of data to read to get that you know forensic checksum. In the context of this little SSD, it's 16 gigs. That makes it very efficient to derive that checksum from the disk. It's only 16 gig to read. And even though those are for, from 2014, you can actually write to them at about 60 uh, megabits or M MB capital. I never know if it's megabyte, megabits. I always mess those up. But anyways, 60 roughly megabyte. Yeah, I think it's megabyte per second. <clears throat> but you can read from this little thing at 250. That means that it is way faster than pretty much all other <clears throat> story medium that I know of to be able to extract this. So that's the number one reason why, <clears throat> damn it, why I really like these. The number two reason is when you're doing work on say super backed OS and you want to have steps that are deterministically repeatable. What I mean here is if you install say uh, Ubuntu, for a Raspberry Pi or for an Intel computer. You go through a whole bunch of steps provisioning that Ubuntu environment. And then say you wanna tweak a few little things and see its impact uh, when you're trying to make it you know, read only if you wanna disable data persistence. Well, the way I usually do it is I'll go about installing you know, or going through a few steps and then I wanna create an image so that I can restore that exact state and time in a repeatable way, because I know I'll screw something up later in the steps and I wanna make sure that it is deterministic, so I wanna be sure that it is repeatable. So I wanna be able to go back in time and not have to go through the whole install process again. So what I tend to do is I'll install Ubuntu, for instance, and then I'll create an image and I'll call it Ubuntu Clean. Then I'm gonna install the dependencies and then I'm gonna call it like pre-read-only. And then finally, I'm gonna have an image that I think is usable and I'm gonna call it, you know, super backed OS. And then that image, I'll flash it onto a disc and make sure that it is indeed forensically read only. And then I will publish it and make it available to you guys on the downloads page 
of Superbad. <clears throat> so again, I want to be able to generate a cryptographic checksum and I want to be able to take snapshots in time. All of those steps are incredibly more efficient if done on fast storage. And when you're imaging or when you're generating a cryptographic checksum, if you can do it at 250 megabits or megabytes, sorry, per second versus say, I don't know, a hundred, well, it's 2.5 times faster. It makes my life so much easier. Now, the last reason why I really like these uh, and why I also really like any small storage. So, I mean, this here, I don't know if this is going to focus. <clears throat> this is a 16 gig micro SD card. That's what I use for Super Backed OS on ARM. So, spoiler alert, Super Back now runs on Raspberry Pi. Well, that's a 16 gig for all the same reasons I mentioned. But there's one last reason why I really like smaller storage devices such as these. In the context of flash memory, you cannot secure erase a drive in the way that you used to do on spinning disks. You have to essentially wipe the whole thing by replacing all data on it with zeros. And usually you have to do a few passes because parts of these types of flash storage devices are not addressable by the operating system. It's like a buffer. It knows that it's going to fail at some times and it's going to use some of that buffer. So essentially, you want to make sure that you override the data of the whole thing a few times. I would say two, three times is usually good enough. Uh, and again, if the thing is like a terabyte, it takes forever. If it's 16 gigs, it's super efficient. So that's really why I've grown obsessed. Um, those are actually hard to find. Um, I bought two on Amazon. I bought another one that I'm going to be testing at Kingston on eBay. Uh, if you can get hold of one of those, it's super cool. Now bear in mind that those smaller ones are typically SATA, not NVMe. Uh, so you need to have a little enclosure that works for SATA. There's one that I really like, this one here. Uh, I'll link to it in the description. There's another that I haven't tested, but that also has a little read, uh, read only switch, which is pretty cool. That means that you can actually enforce read only at the hardware level. I'll be talking about that more in future episodes. Uh, I'm going to be talking of this, which is the world's safest, uh, USB stick. So I'm going to be pretty. Uh, pumped about this in an episode or two. So stay tuned. Actually, if you haven't subscribed, smash that subscribe button. Now I have a few updates uh, about Superbacked. Uh, if you're not a, uh, if you're not into Superbacked, you can you know start watching another episode. But if you're into Superbacked or you want to learn more about Superbacked, here's where the project is at. I've been working tirelessly for about two months now on fine tuning a whole bunch of little things. Uh, the QR code uh, reader was not great on Linux. There was also a bug, uh, I'll link to it down there in the description, with how Electron interfaces with Chromium uh, in a way that leverages uh, native Mac OS scanning of QR codes. So, I mean, in a nutshell, scanning was fabulous on Monterey and it got really bad on Ventura. Um, <clears throat> so I had to do a whole bunch of things. Now, if you're using Superbact on Linux uh, and you install ZBar, it will leverage ZBar for reading QR codes. If you're using Superbacked on Mac OS, uh, it's actually using a native interface to uh, Mac OS's image processing capabilities, which means scanning QR codes is now fabulous on all devices. You should absolutely update. Uh, now, the other thing that I've been working on is adding ARM support. So you can now run Superbacked on Raspberry Pi devices. Um, some of you actually reached out and asked about this. Raspberry Pi devices are really hard to get hold of now, but if you so happen to have one and it has at least two gigs of RAM, a Raspberry Pi 4, uh, you can actually run Superbact on it. Uh, and to that extent, uh, you can download the app or you can now download Superbact OS. So that's another thing that I've been working on tirelessly. Using Superbact is very hard using it well. If you're doing backups of seed material in the context of crypto or any other types of high risk assets, you never want to do this on your everyday computer. You want to do this on an air gapped hardened computer that has data persistence disabled. What I just said is a hell of a mouthful and I know a lot of you will be overwhelmed by this. So a solution to this, uh, that not to this exact problem, but to this kind of problem is uh, you know, being able to install Tails OS, for instance, on a USB flash drive, if you want to use Tor properly, 
Tails is amazing for this, but it doesn't have printer support. So I initially thought we would be using Tails and you know run super backed on it, but printing was impossible. So it just made me slip down a long rabbit hole. Um, Ubuntu has really good printer support, uh, but it's kind of not the right operating system for the job. So I ended up spending quite some time figuring out how to set Ubuntu up as read only. So disabling data persistence and how to provision super backed onto an environment that is not data persistent. Uh, so I've done all of this and I'll be sharing some of the interesting stuff like, you know, using Ducker to be able to, you know, add stuff to images and streamline the process of provisioning super backed OS on Ubuntu. Um, that's kind of really technical. But anyways, the idea is you can now install super backed OS on a USB flash drive, same as Tails OS or any other Linux operating system. There are two versions of super backed OS, one that runs on ARM. So you can actually flash it to a Raspberry Pi. It's super easy. Process kind of looks like this. You used the Raspberry Pi imager to flash the thing that you've downloaded from the Superback website. You need to enter your license code. And then Bazam, a few minutes later, you can just boot to Superback OS, which is an Ubuntu version that has no data persistence that you can actually test forensically, which is really interesting. Um, and that works on uh, ARM, so Raspberry Pi. It also works on Intel computers, which also mean that all of you Windows users that cannot use Superback because Superback does not run on Windows, well, you can now boot Superback OS on your PC and access Superback in a really safe way. So that is super cool. And if you wanna go batshit crazy, you can actually install Superback OS on this little device. Uh, and I will be talking about this in next episode. This is the world's most secure USB flash drive, and it has a few very interesting properties, one of which uh, is enforcing uh, read-only using its secure elements. So that is super cool. That will be the topic of next episode. <clears throat> if you have questions about Superback, let me know down there in the comments. Uh, you absolutely wanna update to the latest version. If you're not a Superback user, the first 10 people to use the promo code down there in the description will get $50 off, the same price as people who were on the waiting list. So yeah, much more to come. I'm out of the rabbit hole. I'll see you soon. Bye.